Hello, this is Miss Dagenford, and I wanted to share with you a very, very interesting tale about the discovery of DNA. <clears throat> and it's a long one, and it contrasts amazingly with the uh, warp speed of the development of the vaccine, right? We knew about the coronavirus back in January, and suddenly we have three viable options for vaccines in December. That is unprecedented in uh, scientific research. Uh, and it shows just the amount of advancement we've done in biotechnology. However, it wasn't always so. Uh, you know, between the lack of technology and the lack of understanding, the search for DNA was a long uh, process. And it begins in the 1800s. So two centuries ago, um, it, we had Gregor Mendel. Now, you probably learned about Mendel's pea plants before. Mendel uh, was able to show that traits are inherited and that there was genetic variation, and he was able to establish the rules of that, and we're going to learn about those later. But no, none of the scientists in the day had really any idea how that happened, and uh, some of the uh, ideas behind it were rather wild. Um, even Charles Darwin tried his hand at coming up with an idea, and it, 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 he was way off the mark. Uh, now, the mid to late 1800s, we were able to discover chemically what DNA is. <clears throat> we found out and were able to isolate them. There was a scientist called um, uh, Phoebus, that was his first name. Uh, and he uh, was able to discover nucleic acids. But again, there wasn't this sense of what they did. In fact, a lot of people thought the nucleus just stored phosphorus because one thing they realized is that the nucleus contained a lot of phosphorus, and that's because DNA has phosphorus. And so for the longest time, we actually thought DNA was quite boring chemically. There's a sugar, there's phosphate, and then four or five different chemicals uh, that they slowly isolated. But, you know, on the whole, we just kind of were like, these are pretty uninteresting. Now, if you contrast that with proteins, we have thousands of proteins in our body. Uh, and we knew that we were starting to identify more and more and more proteins in our body. So you wouldn't be too surprised to think that if you were looking for a genetic material, what caused people to look differently? What caused animals to have different traits? It, you wouldn't be too surprised to think that they thought proteins with their thousands of varieties were the source of the genetic information. And so up, 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 up until the 1900s, in fact, mid 1900s, we were pretty convinced that proteins were the source of genetic variation. Now, just as a quick review for you, um, proteins, if you recall, this is from three months ago, proteins are made of amino acids. And one of the hallmarks of proteins and amino acids is they have nitrogen and they also, some of them have sulfur. So bear that in mind, there are a couple of experiments that end up being very interesting. Um, and then we also have uh, nucleic acids. Now, nucleic acids are things like DNA and RNA. They are made of nucleotides that contain nitrogen and phosphorus. Now, notice something interesting. Proteins have sulfur, but no phosphorus. Nucleic acids have phosphorus, but no sulfur. That's when we come back in one of our experiments. It's kind of an interesting um, uh, uh, way to figure things out. Now, a uh, little side note in history, um, in the 1800s and even early to mid uh, 1900s, one of the things that were really debilitating in terms of an illness was pneumonia. Uh, now, pneumonia is something that we do still worry about. Um, if you went into the hospital with pneumonia, we would get you antibiotics, we would get you x-rays and CT scans to make sure um, that it's not gotten, you know, to a certain point, that it's not become sepsis. Uh, but in the 1800s, pneumonia was close to a death sentence. You could die from it. We still worry about it now, but 
it's not a, oh my gosh, you could die from it. You know, we're, we're pretty confident we can help you. But back in the 1800s and early 1900s, pneumonia was something that we really um, were concerned about. And uh, that's partly because of the nature of the bacteria. So I wanted to show you because this is going to be helpful for the background to the experiments. One of the uh, root causes of pneumonia, pneumonia can be viral, but it can also be bacterial. And uh, if it is bacterial, thankfully, we have antibiotics for it. Uh, now, what you see here are little streptococcus uh, pneumonia uh, uh, bacteria. And so we've got two little bacteria here. And you have two forms of these bacteria, one of which contains a really thick capsule. And a capsule in a bacteria is like a protective coat. It's made of uh, sugary proteins, and it, it kind of covers the bacteria. It's like an invisibility cloak, if you will. Uh, and then we have an uh, non-encapsulated bacteria. So this one is uh, uncovered. It's exposed. Now, over here on the right, we have a white blood cell. And this white blood cell is, uh, this little GIF is showing the white blood cell eating a bacteria. Now, one thing you need to go, and we're kind of sneaking into some immune system, um, awesome stuff, uh, but a white blood cell defeats the enemy in a very simple way. It eats it. So a white blood cell encounters a bacteria uh, and you have your white blood cells in very, very, um, a very, a variety of places in your body. You have white blood cells underneath your skin, in your lungs. And if they don't recognize a cell or a particular substance, they will try to engulf it. And that's what this white blood cell is doing. It's engulfing a bacteria. Now, the other piece of the puzzle you need to know is that if a bacteria has a coating to it, it's going to be really hard for the, for the white blood cell to engulf it. It's got this thick coating, and the white blood cell, how it works is it actually tries to grab the bacteria in order to engulf it. And if it can't do that... Uh, then the bacteria are free to divide and divide and produce toxins in the body. So um, what we knew in the 1900s is that there were different types of bacteria. Uh, the ones that seemed to have this coating were very, very dangerous because they're the ones that seem to cause death. Uh, so what we end up having in the 1920s, there's a scientist uh, whose name is Fred Griffith, and he was trying to study pneumonia with the hope of maybe making a vaccine for it. Uh, now, uh, Fred Griffith used mice uh, for the uh, experiments, and some of these mice will be dying, so just fair warning, uh, but uh, in a noble effort for it. So again, here's my little neutrophil. I thought this was rather funny. Oh, no, he's got Joe. Hurry, guys. And so this little neutrophil is trying to eat the bacteria. Uh, and here is Fred Griffith. Uh, and what he's going to do is he's going to use a bacteria called Streptococcus pneumoniae. And these bacteria cause pneumonia. But only the smooth type of bacteria cause pneumonia. And that's because, again, the bacteria produce this thick coat uh, and so we call them S bacteria for smooth. So the immune cells, the, the white blood cells, they don't eat the S form very well, which means these bacteria happily divide and happily divide and happily divide, causing problems, producing toxins, and unfortunately causing death in some of the situations. Uh, now, there was the, also a form called rough or R. Now, they don't make a coat, uh, and so they are easier for the immune cells to eat, and so we call them a virulent or harmless. So we have the virulent form up here, and then we have our avirulent or harmless form down here. Now, Fred Griffith uh, is, we're going to set, set up the experiment, but I wanted to give you that little bit of background information 
uh, to help you. So uh, as a class, make sure you guys review before we get to the experiment, what it meant to be R, what it meant to be S, and uh, what, uh, why they thought proteins were the genetic uh, molecule.